Hello and welcome back to another episode of Creedle. I am joined today. We are celebrating Ash Wednesday today uh, and joined this afternoon by Larry Chap, good friend of mine and frequent yeah. uh, you know, collaborator, co-conspirator, fellow podcaster now. You've got your own podcast, Larry, so I will, uh, without further ado, yes. direct people to that. It is called Gaudium at Best 22, and you can find it wherever you get your podcast, right, Larry? Yeah, it's Podbean Podcast. You can get it on Spotify, Apple, and uh, Amazon Music. Not Google yet. I'm having some issues with Google. You know, this is uh, some inside baseball in the podcast industry, but uh, Google doesn't really drive much traffic to podcasts. Nowadays, it's all about Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Those are the two big ones. Yeah. And it's available there. And, and it's on it's on both, so that's great. And I had people for a long time asking me to do the audio-only podcast instead of my YouTube videos, and so now I am. Great. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know I'm a huge podcaster uh, and fan of podcasts. I've been doing them for a very long time. I love the audio-only format. The video is great when you have it, but... And it's hard to, hard to be just a really solid, uh, long yeah, listen. Yeah, so. absolutely. Absolutely. Well, today we're going to give some people a, a long listen. We're going to talk about some recent developments in the church. We've got a rescript from Rome, from uh, Cardinal Roche, that uh, applies or clarifies some of the restrictions on the Latin Mass. We'll get to that if we have time. Uh, more, uh, more, maybe not more important, but uh, certainly a higher priority for us to talk about today, because you've written about this very recently, Larry is uh, some yes. some recent reflections on moral theology, we'll call them, from a certain Cardinal McElroy, recently elevated, uh, formerly, well, current Bishop of San Diego, and now Cardinal, recently elevated by uh, the yeah. Holy Father himself, and Cardinal Supich, Archbishop Cardinal Supich uh, of Chicago, my own Archbishop, although I... That's right. Really, I mean, I, as you know, Larry, I'm a communicant uh, at a Byzantine church nearby, so that's actually not under uh, Supich's authority. And I'm a communicant at a Carmelite monastery in Indiana under the, the authority of the Bishop of Gary. So he's my bishop in, in the sense of where I live geographically, but not really my bishop. Geographically. In, in, well, that's like my situation. I attend an Anglican ordinary at parish, and my bishop, therefore, is Bishop Lopes down in Houston and not uh, the right. local bishop here of Scranton, although geographically exactly. he is. Exactly. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, and I think our listeners know that, that uh, we've said before, you know, we're not, uh, for example, when we talk about these issues that are frequently. Um, Frequently uh, thought of as issues affecting only the trads, Larry, the, the TLM crowd. Right. We are not in the TLM crowd. Now, I mean, as we've said no. before, we're both trads in, in a certain sense, but we're not TLM people. Sure. So, um, yeah, but I think uh, you have a certain, uh, you have a very particular uh, or a very insightful way of attacking some of these issues and dissecting them. And I wanted to chat with you about some of these things. So maybe let's start chronologically. It's okay. uh, mid to late January in America Magazine, that esteemed Jesuit publication. Uh, published as an article yeah. by Cardinal McElroy. Again, McElroy, Bishop of San Diego right now, uh, recently elevated to the Cardinalate. And he, uh, he wastes no time in making some extended reflections about how the church's moral theology could in fact change over time and how we need to be really open to the synodal way and open to listening to one another as we discern what exactly the Spirit has in store for the future of the church. Now, that's yeah. an awful lot of words that could mean nothing. It's also an awful lot of words that could mean a whole lot of things. And I think the general sense that people have from McElroy, who I think uh, himself even uh, signaled after after he wrote this, that he is, in fact, suggesting that the church's moral theology can change. Uh, this is a pretty pretty dangerous idea. I was I reread the piece today in, prepar in preparation for our time, and we can dive into this one a bit. Uh, but then I also reread a, a an even less impressive piece, Larry, from... Uh, Archbishop yeah. Supich. And uh, Supich's yes. piece is very short. It is called something about exclusion. Uh, oh, yeah, here it is. It's called A Church Called to Love Perfectly. And yeah. um, love Larry, perfectly. I'll let you yeah. I'll let you give a 30-second reaction or summation of this, and then I will do a slightly deeper dive on what exactly Supich is saying here. It's a short piece, so it won't take okay. long. And then yeah. we'll talk about all the problems with it. So... In 30 seconds or less, what is Supich saying uh, in your view here? In, in 30 seconds or less, Supich is uh, misusing the theology of Pope Benedict, uh, wherein he claims that in Deus Caritas S, Post Benedict, Pope Benedict's emphasis upon uh, the radical and infinite love of God trumping God's justice uh, means that Pope Benedict is totally in line with Pope Francis now and, and he, Cardinal Supich, in their desire to essentially have open table fellowship in the Eucharist, communion for all 
well, not all, but most people that we would say are, are, are he doesn't he doesn't identify as sexual sins as such. But he's yep. he and McElroy are clearly talking about sexual sins. Uh, and he says, because of this, because of God's infinite love, the church cannot exclude in advance certain classes of sinners from going to communion. Uh, and, and this is simply both a misuse of Benedict and goes contrary to millennia of church teaching going all the way back to St. Paul on Eucharistic discipline. Uh, the idea that we can't in 30 seconds or less, uh, you know, the idea that we can't, that we can no longer call certain sexual sins, mortal sins, and that therefore that bars you from going to communion is Supich's main point. We need to get rid of that. And he, he's claiming Pope Benedict would agree with that. And that is simply, as I say in my, in my essay today, it scarcely rises to the level of nonsense. Uh, it, it's so wrong. It just staggers the imagination. It is a terrible short little essay riddled with the silliest and most superficial kind of theology. Um, and, and bad logic. Um, I also found, yeah, terrible it, logic. Found, it, I found it very interesting that um, the good cardinal decided to wait until Pope Benedict was in the grave uh, before yes. publishing publicly this idea that he and Francis saw eye to eye on this. And in fact, uh, happen to fully support Supich's agenda on all of these topics. So uh, rather interesting timing there. Um, By the way, not to interrupt, it's rather interesting, right, that he's kind of claiming that Pope Francis would agree with he, Supich, you know, about this entire idea that we can't exclude certain sins from Eucharistic communion. Yes, yeah. Uh, I have a thought on that as well. I also wanted to tell you, though, before we really dive in, that uh, I heard from a friend yesterday who read your article and he said it was a great article and he said um thank larry for all of us he helps his article made me laugh the same way i laugh reading some of saint jerome's letters because you have this very <laughs> uh, sort of pugilistic style about you it's, I it's also you you're you're a much more charitable um you have a much more charitable way of elocution than, for example, David Bentley Hart. But you both have these this sort of the similar style that I imagine Saint Jerome. Well, as, as well, yeah, but also, I mean, if this were just a straight up blog post of mine, I would have probably been far more sar sarcastic. Yeah. Uh, but it's for Catholic Old Report and my wonderful, fantastic editor Carl Olson. He's just a fantastic editor, a great guy. Uh, he deletes certain things and says, "Well, uh, that's a great zinger, but that really we we can't put that in." Uh, a bit too so, far. Um, yeah. Well, I, uh, I do appreciate Carl's editing though, because he does, he does leave a good bit of zingers in there. Uh, I like the part about, uh, oh, you know, dripping, yeah. dripping bourbon out of crystal, crystal cups made in sweatshops while sitting, <laughs> yeah. sweatshops while yeah. sitting on furniture made in sweatshops. Uh, what was the, what yeah. was the final one? Oh, wearing tweed jackets made in sweatshops. Um, yeah. lots of good stuff there. Okay. So this supich article, let's just dissect it a little bit uh, in more detail. I think your, your summation was perfect. Um, it's exactly what he's trying to do, I think. Uh, but let's just talk through some of these sort of errors of logic and, and leaps and thinking that he that he makes here. So he starts out saying, among the many points of convergence between the late Pope Benedict XVI and Pope Francis is their emphasis on the power of grace, which is God's love for his people. From different perspectives, both popes insist that this love is totally unconditional, mysterious, transformative, and gratuitous. Okay, so far, so good? Yeah, yeah, fine. Yeah. So he goes on, Pope Francis warns against the cold and hard Gnostic logic that attempts to domesticate the mystery of God's grace. Um, okay, so on and so forth. And How then it's he, Gnostic logic, I have no idea. Yeah, I, I also don't don't quite understand that. But, but then he quotes um, Gaudete at Exultate and says, when somebody has an answer for every question, it is a sign that they are not on the right road for God is full of surprises. So that's kind of the linchpin of this this uh, thesis for Supich. Yeah, who, right? who's saying, by the way, that we have all the answers? I completely agree with you. This is this this is definitely a uh, this is what we call a straw man, right? I don't yeah, I don't see a single person. Out there. Yeah, sometimes when you disagree with someone, it's easy to say you're attacking a straw man, but he is. There, right. There's nobody, nobody out there who holds the line on Catholic orthodoxy in matters of moral theology, right. who claims that we have all the answers. It's ridiculous. Right. So that is lo that is logical fallacy one. There's a complete yeah. straw man set up here. Uh, the next logical fallacy we don't have to wait long for. It's literally the next paragraph because he he goes on. So he quotes Francis and says. If someone has every answer for every question, that's a sign that they're not on the right road. Okay. So then the next paragraph. So a pastoral approach that preemptively excludes someone from the life of the church and her ministry is a serious matter and must be challenged. So now he's saying that uh, because Francis says if someone says they have all the answers, they're not on the right road, that if someone says they have any answer at all or they know any answer, then they're not on the right road. So, so now yeah. he's making another yeah. leap and completely misapplying. What he's opposed to his answers. 
Yes, exactly. He's opposed to any answers at all. Anything. Yeah, definitive, yeah. Anything. And, and matters of sex. And it's clear he's talking about sexuality. And we, we, we can't have answers there because every situation is unique. Every situation is idiosyncratic. Every individual has to be taken in this radically monistic way as this right. standalone entity uh, who doesn't really fall under any generic moral laws with regard to sexual moral theology. Yeah, and precisely. Um, he goes on to quote Francis again from the same document. Even when someone's life appears completely wrecked, even when we see it devastated by vices or addictions, God is present there. True. Okay. True. Of course. I mean, like, I, this, yeah. this doesn't actually support super just thesis. It's, it's true no, words. And, and who among us, among the the more orthodox, yeah. uh, would would say that God is no longer present to, to sinners? I, uh, I have no idea. Yeah. I mean, that that is, you, you already brought this up with the straw man, right? No one actually says, I have all the answers. No no one I know says that. No traditional Catholic who holds no. to the Orthodox season says that. Uh, but this this Supic falls falls victim to this sloppy, sort of Trumpian way of arguing. You know, remember, remember how when Trump would give you speeches, he would say, like, many people are saying, many people are saying, I'm yeah. the best president of all time. Many who's saying that you know yeah same, yeah same thing with super cheer who is saying what you are what you are saying they're saying yeah exactly what he's he's giving a caricature of the traditional church's views and those who support it a, a, a profoundly wrong caricature right in order to set it up and knock it down and say that's why we have to basically have eucharistic communion for all for all people but you see the dishonesty in that is this he doesn't really mean that and this is why I say, if you really unpack it, you can see that what he's talking about are, are sexual sins mm -hmm. uh, of various kinds, divorce and remarriage, LGBTQ, uh, cohabitation. That kind of, Because I tell you, if if the Grand Wizard of the KKK were a Catholic and he walked up for communion in Supich's communion line wearing his Grand Wizard outfit, yeah. I highly doubt that Supich would give him communion. I don't think he's saying we should have open table fellowship for racists and misogynists and anti-Semites, neo-Nazis, and anybody like that. He would be the first one to deny communion to somebody walking up for communion with with an, a swastika, you know, armband on giving the Sieg Heil sign as he went up for communion. I mean, it's it, it, that's an extreme example, I know, but it simply cannot be the case that Cardinal Supic really and truly believes that absolutely everybody should be allowed up for communion. So it's kind of clear what he's driving at here, especially in light of the McElroy essay. McElroy's far more honest, far more forthcoming when he says, we're talking about sexual sins here. That's what we're talking about. Yep. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Uh, it, Supic does not take long to pivot to the late Pope Benedict, who he, he, who he as you've pointed out, misappropriates. And he says that in writing what he already quoted, Pope Francis builds on an important insight about the uniqueness of God's love, which Pope Benedict identified in his encyclical Deus Caritas Est, God is love. Surely, the late Pope observes, the love God has for his people can rightly be described as a passionate love, which the word eros expresses. Yet that love, he reminds us, is also totally agape, a love that moves beyond the selfish interests and, quote, from Benedict, becomes concern and care for the other, becomes renunciation, and it is ready and even willing or sacrifice. All right, so God's uh, love for his people is gratuitous, unconditional, etc. Uh, again, not really sure how that supports, it, well, it doesn't support Subich's point here, but he, he then goes on uh, to describe Benedict citing the prophet Hosea in describing how Israel had committed adultery. And of course, um, we I think we know the story. Subich doesn't go even this far, but Hosea ends up marrying a prostitute in order to basically to typify or to demonstrate God's love for, for Israel, his covenant people who had been unfaithful. Right. Um, and so Supich's commentary on here on this is notice that God forgives before anything else and before what justice would demand. Then Supich continues, Benedict seems to double down on this and write something quite astonishing to the point that he was criticized by some theologians at the time. Quote, God's passionate love for his people, a forgiving love, is so great that it turns God against himself, his love against his justice. End quote. Now, Larry, you're someone who's very familiar with the writings of Benedict and have read Deus Caritas yes. Est. I don't know. I'm guessing yes. a dozen times. Um, and I'm, I'm yeah. guessing you're, you're pretty well equipped to, to describe to us what Benedict was talking about when he talks about God's love being turned against his justice. So is is Benedict saying what, what Cardinal Supich says he's saying here? 
no, he's not. Uh, and it's and and I think Supich knows that he's not. Uh, certainly not with regard to the to the conclusions uh, that Supich wants to draw, namely open table fellowship for all kinds of sinners. Right. What Benedict is talking about here, in, in in kind of a poetic way, and we have to be precise here about that. All right, it's, he's being lyrical and poetic. He's 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 talking in in the language of resource month theology and not in the deductive logic of scholastic. Uh, Thomistic categories here. Right. And, and all he's really saying is, is that uh, within God, love has priority. And that's absolutely true. Uh, this is what the New Testament, this is what Christ reveals. God's justice is a function of the divine love. This is kind of what Benedict means when he says the love is turned against his justice. He doesn't really mean there's some kind of internal war going yin on yang, within the Godhead. Yeah. yeah, with the yin and yang or God sort of silently wrestling within himself. What he's talking about is the priority of the economy of salvation and redemption over the economy of perdition, that grace has a greater power than sin. This is the entire message of the New Testament and its liberative power. Um, and, and, and so what Benedict is saying is, yes, sin is real, sin exists, and he's talking about the whole theodrama of, of the dynamic interplay between divine and human freedom and salvation history. And in that theodrama, there are these various covenants that involve human response to the divine initiative, uh, and that over and over and over again, humans fall short, and God keeps trumping that falling short and renewing the covenant until he finally arrives in Christ and initiates this new regime of grace, wherein grace is now inscribed in our hearts, turns them into hearts of flesh rather than stone, so we can live a life of sanctification internally. And Benedict certainly wants to emphasize then that the, the path of sanctification, where we appropriate grace freely in our own choosing, is not an option. It is absolutely a baseline necessity of Christian discipleship, uh, what the New Testament simply calls, you know, what the early church called the way. Uh, and the way is the way of repentance and conversion. What are the first lines of Jesus in the Gospel of Mark? Repent and believe the good news. This is the message of Benedict. This is what he's saying here. Yes, God's love is unconditional, and that unconditional love trumps perdition in the sense that they're not equal poised. They're not equal possibilities in a sense, because God wants us to be saved. But we have to respond in freedom. We are still capable of sin. We are still capable of rejecting this overture of love. And when we sin, we have to repent. And, and what Benedict's point is, is that God's not, when we sin, he's not going to hold a cold justice and heartless justice over our heads. Well, you had your chances. Now you're just screwed because right. uh, now I'm going to judge. No, he said he's going to come back at us and at us and at us and at us over and over, hammering away at us until um, hopefully we repent and return. So nothing that Benedict is saying is is contrary to the traditional notion that we need to repent of our sins and that some sins are quite serious. Some sins actually break and rupture our fundamental relationship with God and bar us from communion. And we should not, we should not receive communion when we are in those sins. Now, whether or not every single person enmeshed in particular sins, let's say sexual sins, is guilty of a mortal sin. That's an open pastoral question. And if Supich, if Cardinal Supich had wanted to discuss that as McElroy did, uh, then, then it would have been a better essay. We could have talked about pastoral exigencies and the subjectivity and culpability of individual consciences. Even right. John Paul II wrote about that in Veritati Splendor, about the necessity of pastors, you know, going softly, softly, softly and dealing with people. And so the whole, you know, notion of accompaniment and discernment is, is you know, that's a valid one. But that's a separate question entirely of the culpability of individual sinners to going on to say, and that 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 we can't we can't bar anyone in advance, objectively speaking, from communion uh, because of sexual sins, um, because that's not what Benedict is saying. Yeah, it seems to me it's it's just a sloppy uh, it's a sloppy argumentative move to 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 take one of Benedict's lines from something entirely different from what Supich is talking about, and then apply it in a very narrow sense to support this argument that Supich is making. Um, yeah, it's very similar. What the, the argument Rotzinger's making is very similar to the argument that Balthazar makes in, in you know, Dare We Hope That All Be Saved. If you read the stuff in Dare We Hope and in Volume 5 of Balthazar's Theodrama, 
uh, the, the stuff on hell and judgment will curl your toenails. I mean, Balthazar was no cheap grace kind of guy, and neither is Ratzinger. Uh, and what they're both emphasizing is this great interplay between judgment and mercy, judgment and redemption, judgment and grace, and that this is a dynamic that has a tension in the New Testament that is only resolved finally in Christ uh, and in our own appropriation of, of what Christ does for us. But that tension and that interplay remains. It's not dissolved. And Supich makes it sound as if, well, suddenly, because of the love of God, all of this tension between judgment and redemption is now just dissolved, uh, especially in these sort of sexual sins. It's crazy. I agree. I like your mention of cheap grace as well. Let's let's go down a little a little rabbit hole talking about cheap grace. I think it fits with Cardinal Supich's second to last paragraph in this essay. He says, talking about those who, well, let me, let me actually back up a little bit. The third to, the third to last paragraph says, uh, unfortunately, some in the church struggle to understand the insights of these magisterial teachings. I think he's right on that, Larry, but I don't think the some are the people he's he has in mind. <laughs> you, might, yeah, you might want to look yeah. in the mirror. Um, he says, there are voices that insist the church must exclude sinners from fuller participation in the life of the church until they have reformed out of respect for God's justice. Yet, Pope Benedict would remind them that God's love is so great and mysterious that it turns God against himself and turns his love against his justice. And then he goes on. This is this is about the cheap grace that, that we should talk about. And yeah. Pope Francis would warn them against domesticating the mystery of the grace of God by pretending to limit it by their cold and harsh logic. For treating God's grace, no matter the moment or circumstance it may come, as if as if it were a as if it were a reward for what we have done, robs it of any sense of mystery. Okay. So by treating God's grace as a reward for what we've done, robs it of any sense of mystery. Uh, Who says that, again, by the way? I, I, claims, that's exactly what I was going to say. Who, Who says no that one grace, says that? <laughs> that's Pelagian, that yes. God gives us grace after we've done some good stuff. Right. I mean, that's nobody says that. That's nobody. not what anybody is claiming. Yeah, uh, that's exactly right. But I think he, he, is, he is setting up cheap grace as an alternative to this straw man that he has set up, right? He said, look, some people in the church have this idea that we have to be perfect to earn God's grace. That's wrong. God's grace utterly transcends uh, anything we can comprehend and is limitless and infinite. And so what we really have to recognize is that we don't have to do anything at all ever, period, to follow God. Just There's, there's grace here, and we just sort of have to embrace that that mystery. Well, there's a, there's almost a Protestant-sounding ethos to this in, yes. in a sort of law-gospel dialectic where, you know, our sins are, are like scarlet, but God's grace, God's, you know, salvation is a very forensic thing where God essentially tosses a white blanket over our sins and no longer sees them. So we're free to come up for communion, in, in essence, no matter what we've done, right. because uh, God's already forgiven all that stuff, regardless of our response to, to the movement of grace. You know, it, it is true. We don't, we can't do anything to earn grace, but we can do things to reject grace. Yes. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, that's the cheap grace part you're talking about here. Yes. He seems to imply that not only is there nothing that we can do to earn grace, but that also that there's nothing that we can do to lose it. Right. Uh, <laughs> no matter what our sins are, that God's grace will always be there in a modality that means we're whole, we're, we're redeemed, we're saved, almost against our will. And because sin is a turning away from God. And if I can turn away from God, but God, in a sense, doesn't care, he's still going to uh, you know, he's, he's still going to heal me even without my cooperation. This is absolutely contrary to 2000 years of Catholic theological thinking on the process of sanctification. It's not automatic. I don't know what Cardinal Supich is talking about here. I totally agree with you. And I think you're right to point out this sort of this, this echo of Protestantism. And that's not to say that all Protestantism holds to this cheap grace, but no, cheap, grace, cheap grace has infected Protestantism for longer than it has infected Catholicism, I think. Uh, I mean, look at the writings of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, for example, who was really disturbed by the prevalence of cheap grace throughout the time in Germany when he was living and eventually was uh, yeah, was killed yeah. for believing what he believed. So he wrote very strongly against this idea of cheap grace. Cheap, you know, grace does not grace is bestowed freely upon us, but it does not come without cost. And the cost of that grace is following Jesus, because to not follow him is to actually reject the grace that he offers. And so that's that's your point, right? So in yeah. this monergistic framework where we where we have no we have no ability to shut ourselves off from the grace that God offers, um, I think it's easy to fall into this this kind of thinking. This this sort yeah, of cheap. Yeah, I, I, kind of I agree. It almost uh, he Supich doesn't allude to this, but I think the position he takes almost logically entails that what he has adopted is what we call in moral theology. It's been around now for many decades. Is the theory of the fundamental option. 
Uh, and what the fundamental option means is that deep in the interior of your soul, uh, you make a fundamental option in favor of God. You have faith in God, you trust in God, you trust in God's grace. That's your fundamental option. Uh, and that it's very, very hard to rupture that fundamental option. And therefore, mortal sins are far, far, far fewer uh, than what we think, because it's really, really hard to dislodge and rupture that fundamental option in favor of God. What means then, the upshot of that is you can commit all kinds of sins that we used to think were mortal sins and so on. You can commit all kinds of those sins, uh, but you're not really committing a mortal sin. So implicit in and what Supic is saying, I think, is is a denial that mortal sins are really possible. I think this is what's going on here to a great extent. With the rare exception of, say, murder or rape, okay, or wanton adultery uh, in, in promiscuous ways, I, I think he would say our fundamental option is, let's say I'm cohabitating with my girlfriend before marriage, or I'm a gay man in a serious relationship with another gay man, or I'm divorced, I'm divorced and remarried and have been so happily for 20 years without an annulment. Uh, I think what Cardinal Supic would say is those people have a fundamental option for God, and they're not committing mortal sins, and therefore we should allow them to communion. And I, w I just wish that he would be more forthcoming in explaining what his moral theological underpinnings are here. And I think if he did, what we would see is he subscribes to some version of this fundamental option theory. So where did this fundamental option idea originate? Who came up with it? Well, I don't really know who the originator. I know Karl Rahner popularized it. Uh, oh, OK. Way, okay. way back in the day uh, that, uh, you know more and, and Ronner was no cheap grace guy and Ronner was uh, certainly a decent moral thinker in his own right but he he certainly had imbibed the spirit of modernity to an extent that in a lot of things uh, that we would normally consider mortal sin especially in the sexual domain certainly do not touch our core so it's a rather superficial view of the, of the significance of of sex i mean Cardinal it sounds, Macro it sounds almost pl like uh, like platonist yeah, it is. That's why it's kind of ironic that Supic would accuse uh, like our side of the equation as being uh, having a Gnostic logic, <laughs> yeah. when in fact there's a kind of quasi Gnostic logic going here and that it doesn't really matter what I do with my body because that's just the realm of the flesh. All that matters is what my spirit is doing and my spirit has chosen God. And since it's chosen God, I can engage in all of these other activities that don't rupture my fundamental choice for God. And yeah. God's always already there waiting to forgive me and so on. You know, and, and at least Cardinal McElroy's essay had the decency to say that he disagreed with the idea uh, that all sexual sins are grave matter. And, you know, and I, I, I think that that's a serious question that we need to, to, to debate just a bit. I don't think Cardinal McElroy on the face of that is simply wrong. Um, it's something that I've talked about before as well. There is a... It, it, you know, in one sense, I agree with the traditional natural law moral the theology that says, you know, any misuse of the sexual faculty is automatically grave matter. OK, fine. Um, but we need to have that opens up some serious pastoral questions. And and I applaud Cardinal McElroy and to a certain extent, Cardinal Supic for and Pope Francis for raising the question of subjective culpability and the diminishment and mitigation of culpability with regard to certain sexual sins. That's fine. That's, an, that's a serious intellectual theological conversation, pastorally speaking, we need to have. But then to come out and say, because we have a pastoral issue with every single sexual sin being considered grave matter, objectively speaking, therefore we can now conclude that they're not grave matter. We can simply conclude that 99.9% .9 of sexual sins are, are innocuous and do not rupture your fundamental option, are, are, are venial sins at best, and therefore we need to open up the Eucharistic table uh, to all kinds of people. We, this is a laxity which is extremely dangerous. I mean, I, I, I'm not a finger-wagging moralizer that says we need to return to the days where every single dirty thought you got in your head is a, is a dead gum mortal sin and you're going to burn in hell. I mean, who's saying that? Nobody's really saying that. Um, but the, like you said, there are these leaps of logic, these inconsistent leaps of logic to go from we need to, to reexamine the idea that all sexual sins are inherently objectively grave matter to they're not grave matter at all. And they're all just venial sins. I, I, I don't get that. I don't get that at all. Um, it's interesting to contrast the, uh, the approach here with uh, the catechetical approach that we even gave our children, you know, 40, 50 years ago. 
I obviously wasn't alive then, but you would have been a child around that time. Uh, yes. And my my wife, um, someone just gave us several old St. Joseph's children's missiles from, I think, the 60s and 70s. So this is post Vatican II for sure, but but we're but we're in the uh, in the sort of the manualist tradition at that point still of of catechesis. And there's this one page. I'll just send this to you, Larry. But there's a page um, to teach the children about mortal and venial sins. This is, I think, a, a guide to confession. And it says at the bottom in, red, in in giant red print. Now read this carefully. And then the paragraph that follows: the worst thing in the whole world is mortal sin. It kills the divine life in your soul and makes you deserve to suffer in hell. After mortal sin, the next worst thing is venial sin. Some young persons, and even old ones, care nothing about venial sin. Quote, it is only a venial sin, they say, and venial sins do not make you deserve to suffer in hell. End quote. How stupid. Persons who do not try to keep out of venial sin find it hard to keep out of mortal sin. And besides, who wants to suffer in purgatory for being careless about venial sins? Be smart. Try to keep out of all sins, mortal and venial. I okay, think that's so, why that's very wise. I think that's yeah, true. I, I think so too. Oftentimes, these distinctions we make, we make between venial and mortal sin is in order to simply dismiss the venial sins is not really important at all. Yes. And I think that's kind of what Supich and McElroy are doing. <laughs> it's it's a very legalistic re approach in its own way. Yes. You know, saying well because these are just venial sins, they're not really sins at all. Really, come on, we all know that it's okay to commit a venial sin. Uh, no, we don't know that. Um, because venial sins easily then lead to mortal sins. Right. I, I had my last podcast conversation was with, was with a guy named John Monaco. Do you know John? No. He's a fellow Pennsylvanian, actually. He's, uh, he's um, based uh, near Pittsburgh. He's pursuing a doctorate uh, at Duquesne in theology. But he recently moved east to the Melkite Greek Catholic Church uh, within the Byzantine Rite. And he and I were talking very briefly about medial and me venial and mortal sins and how that distinction isn't emphasized in the east as it is in the west and no, i appreciate i appreciate the lack of distinction because the important thing is that every sin separates us from god right mortal sins do so in a, in a total way venial sins in a less total way or in a not total way but but they yeah. all separate us from, from the love of god I, um, yeah look I, i'd be i'd be first in line to say we need a uh we need a sort of revamping of these categories of mortal and venial sin. I mean, back in the yeah. day, I mean, they, these, these, these distinctions were made in order to aid confessors and to guide penitents and what, what needs to be confessed and what doesn't need to be confessed. And, and the lines of demarcation are often quite artificial. You know, like, uh, it, it, let's take theft, for example. I mean, I remember learning in moral theology in seminary, okay, uh, from a moral theological manual written by a guy named Peschke. And in there, the question is, how much money, if I'm stealing money from somebody, how much money do I steal before it's a mortal sin? You know, $50, $100, uh, you know, and, and, and so then you read, I think the arbitrary line was like $100 or something. Wow. Uh, you know, it's yeah. just insane. Of course, you know, with inflation and stuff, hundred bucks is not a hundred bucks <laughs> like it was then, right? I'll be uh, like but still, you're, I, I remember sitting there as a seminary and thinking, well, that's just plain stupid. That is, you know, yeah. the, the fact is theft is a really serious thing and you, you ought just not do it uh, at all. So you're right. I, I, I think your Byzantine friend is, is absolutely correct. Uh, that sometimes these, I, I hope this doesn't mark me off as a heretic, but I, I do sometimes think that we overemphasize these distinctions between venial and mortal sins. Hey, look, look at the Sermon on the Mount, for example. I think this is what Christ is doing as well. Uh, what Christ is, Christ doesn't make in the Sermon on the Mount, he doesn't make the law of Moses easier. He makes it harder. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so in, in some sense, the distinction between venial and mortal sins allows us a kind of get out of jail free card. So I can sin up to this point and it's just venial. And what Christ is kind of saying in the Sermon on the Mount, man, no, 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 no. Sin is really awful all the way down. All right. And so even if you have lust in your heart, you've already committed adultery yes, and yes. these kinds of things. Um, so there, there's a, there's a, a, you know, deepening in the Sermon on the Mount of, of the necessity of avoiding sin of all kinds. And I mean, because the Jews of Jesus time lived very f in that legalistic framework of, okay, if I, if I, if, if I do this, how close to violating the law am I? Uh, am I violating the law if I do this other thing? And Jesus said, forget all that. All right. Just avoid sin, period. And, and enter into the spirit of, of, of the moral commandments and not simply their letter. It is, it's, 
just inconceivable to me that Supich writes this little essay uh, as ostensibly a reflection on the mass readings for that weekend. And the mass readings for that weekend are, it was the seventh Sunday in ordinary time. The gospel reading was Matthew chapter five, as you were just saying, Sermon on the Mount. Um, Jesus says, you've heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you, that, that you may be children of your heavenly father. Um, and it ends with, so be perfect, just as your heavenly father is perfect. So it, it does not end with, right. with Jesus, right. with Jesus being, um, you know, an, an, an anti, an, an, he's not, he's not adopting his sort of antinomianism. He's not saying the laws no. don't matter. He's actually yeah, saying it's exactly right. Yeah, the laws are there for to draw you closer to God. That's what matters. So be perfect as your heavenly Father's perfect. And you That's will your not en- you will not enter into the divine presence unless you are perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Because right. no sin, no evil can enter into union with God. Because by definition, it will resist God. Um, you know, so it's not like God looking at you and saying, "Oh, you're impure, so you can't come in." It's it's a question of the capacity for God that we have created within ourselves. And insofar as there are sins that remain within us, we have a diminished capacity for God. And the greater the sin, the less the capacity, and perhaps even to the point of no capacity. Uh, and that's why all sins are dangerous, because you're decapacitating the, 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 the thirst for God within you. Uh, and, and it seems to me that what Supich is, is saying in this letter is we don't, we're not any longer going to attend to the notion of sin as a decapacitation of your, of your ability to receive God, uh, because God is going to capacitate you one way or the other. God's going to fill you one way or the other, because after all, his love trumps his justice. I mean, that is to treat God's justice as simply a concern with forensic externals and not with the capacitation of me as a human being to receive God. Yeah, that's such a good point. We've had, Larry, I don't know, 10, 12 conversations on on this podcast and on yours. Yeah. And one, one of my favorites, and it might have been our very first one, was on de facto atheism. Yes. You, you had written this blog post, probably still one of your most popular, I would guess about how we're a church of de facto atheists and our clergy yeah. leading us are de facto atheists. And what you meant by that was not necessarily that they don't believe in God, but that they behave as if they don't believe in God. And the image the image of God that they do worship bears little resemblance to the triune God of historic creedal Christianity. Um, and I think about that a lot, a lot. Uh, and I think about that when people like Cardinal Supich writes writes this piece or Cardinal Pagaro writes his. I think what do these men actually believe? And that's yeah. The Christianity that they are espousing really seems to bear very little uh to have little in common with the Christianity that I espouse. And I was thinking about that more uh as I read your your critique of Supich in the Catholic World Report. And you have this line that basically says, um, you know, what's what's Supich getting at here? What's he trying to do? He's embracing this this relativism, perhaps, and then you say, uh, "You say no one, no one's really a relativist. A, a tr- no one's really a true relativist." I think you say, "Right, right." And so, Ever. so yeah. What 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 do you mean by that? Uh, and how does that help us understand what Supich is doing? Well, I I think it's because of who we are as human beings, made in the image and likeness of God. And as Aquinas pointed out, we have a f- fundamental orientation to the good. Yeah. Uh, that we don't desire anything, even when we're committing evil, we don't desire anything except that we're trying to attain some good. What makes an evil action an evil action is that we've sacrificed greater goods to lesser goods, but we're still trying to achieve some good. Uh, and we, so we have this fundamental orientation to the good. And you see this all the time in, in people who claim that, well, moral is rel- morality is relative to the in- individual. And then all of a sudden they get, they wax extremely dogmatic and very hortatory and very judgmental. Should you say anything against LGBTQ or you know uh, climate change or or whatever? All the all the typical sort of lefty, uh, yeah. trendy lefty issues. Nobody, no. Just as there's no atheist in a foxhole, I'm not certain that that's true. But just as you know, the old line: there's no atheist in a foxhole. There's also really there are there are no relativists in the in the heat of the moment. I mean. If you look at the causes that people on the left, for example, the ones who are most likely to be, quote unquote, relativists, the causes they champion, they champion with a dogmatic certitude. So no, no, but no human being. In other words, I'm saying that it's simply impossible based on human nature for a human being to be truly a relative. You might hold in your mind 
a theory of morality that is relativist. But in action, you cannot live that. Just as nobody can be an, a complete nihilist. You can be a nihilist in theory, but nobody can live that way. Nobody can live in Nietzsche's world of the upside down. Nobody yeah, well, can live there. there. There's, who, who's the thinker who said there, were, there have never been any true atheists with perhaps the exception of Nietzsche? Have you heard that quip before? Yeah, yeah. I forget uh, who said that, but I think about that one a lot as well. And it, it reminded me of your relativism quote here. Yeah. And so my, my claim is that the culture in which we live has a de, fact, a de facto atheism at its heart because modernity is predicated on the notion uh, that in our social construction, in our social relationships, God doesn't matter. Uh, it's okay. In other words, we grant religious freedom. It's okay if you want to have all these pious thoughts individually. Uh, but religion, God, the transcendent, uh, transcendent based moral theories, none of that has a play. Uh, or a purchase uh, uh, on, on our social gatherings. And what that means is that what modernity has created what sociologists call the pl a certain plausibility structures. In other words, what is it that we instinctively consider to be plausible, uh, rational, the truly real? And what our cult, the, the boilerplate position, the default position of our culture is what is most real, what is, tr is matter. We, we're sort of instinctive yeah. naturalists right. and we don't, our minds don't naturally, except with great effort, rise to a transcendent referent. Okay. And so this is a kind of de facto atheism at the heart of our culture. And my claim is that a lot of religion in our time is, is downstream of that culture and that many of the leaders in our church, if you look at their actions and look at what they say, uh, there, there is a masking going on there, I think, of a deep, deep unbelief in its core, an, an unbelief that is taking the form of a kind of de facto naturalism, materialism, and atheism. Yes, I, I do believe that most strongly. Yeah, I mean, it, it makes a lot of sense, and that thesis has a lot of explanatory power when you look yeah. at the way that yeah. these these well, men behave. Yeah. It's it's exactly why they see uh, in the the constructions of secular modernity good things. I mean, the, I mean, this is another way that Supic misuses Benedict in the sense that in the second part of my essay in Catholic World Report was about Su uh, Benedict's reading of the signs of the times. And Benedict's reading of the signs of the times is that the modern world opens up an abyss below us. That's why I called the article, The Hermeneutics of the Abyss. He, you know, he talks about Therese of Lisieux and her temptations to atheism. And then Ratzinger talks about, you know, how basically she felt the yawning abyss of nothingness and meaninglessness and atheism below her. This is this is the abyss that modernity opens up below us as it hollows out the heavens above us. This is our cultural situation. And Ratzinger is extremely astute, very astute at diagnosing it as such. Therefore, his concerns with the dictatorship of relativism are simply a symptom of this deeper rot, as I call it, this deeper level unbelief, which is the abyss that lurks below us. My claim is that Supic, now in invoking Benedict, all right, to, to justify the importation of sexual sins to the altar rail, uh, not the people are committing sexual sins at the altar rail, you get my point, yeah, yeah. Uh, that, that, that he's fundamentally at odds with Benedict's reading of the signs of the times. Yes. Supic looks at the signs of the times. He doesn't see the abyss. He doesn't see a, a, a unbelief at the core of it all. He sees all these good things that we need to embrace. Um, and, and so that to me is the fundamental misreading. Uh, forget the, the lines he quotes. The fundamental misuse of Benedict by Supic is in using Benedict to baptize the sexual revolution, which Benedict clearly thought was an element of the abyss below us. The, it, 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 the sexual revolution in destroying uh, sexual norms, in, in, in making transgression uh, a virtue, sexual transgression almost a virtue, does nothing but then to increase meaninglessness, a nomi, uh, the abyss below us. And that Supic, therefore, is doubling down on that abyss. And, and Benedict would most strongly disagree with that. Uh, this is random, but enomi is a word, I, a French word, right? But I only recently learned it through a novel by J.K. Rowling. She has a series of mystery novels that she's writing under right. a pen name of Robert Galbraith. Yeah. Uh, and, but that word, it holds so much sort of, um, it, it's, like a, it's like a combination of, uh, of, I guess, ennui and the abyss sort of, right? In, in the yeah, connotations yeah, of my mind. And it's yeah, pretty terrifying. Yeah. It's a pretty terrifying state of existence to think about. It right? is the end result of ennui. 
ennui yeah. on steroids leads yeah. to uh, the acedia of, of anomi or just yeah. the feeling of absolute meaninglessness right. in everything. And the, and the complete depressive disquiet that this creates in a soul, which then becomes tortured by it, tortured by this meaninglessness. And it's paralyzing. It's absolutely paralyzing when someone is overcome with this. I, I, would, I have a psychologist friend uh, it was an utter agnostic and secularist who believes that at, at root of so much mental, uh, at root of so much uh, psychiatric levels of depression in our culture today is simply this anomie, this, yeah. this crisis of meaning. I, w I do not disagree with that at all. I think that's, that's very true. And that's what Supich doesn't seem to get. Uh, he he seems to think that in in blessing these irregular sexual unions or whatever that you're decreasing the anomie, you're decreasing right. the ennui, you're decreasing the anxiety, the cognitive dissonance, the tensions, the feelings of super ego guilt and a Freudian register. You're decreasing all of that, and therefore you're engaged in an act of mercy. Uh, and and I think this gets it as I call it. That's honey laced. That's arsenic laced with honey. Yes. It sounds great. But when you swallow that pill, that nonsense, it's going to kill you. Yes. Uh, so a church that says to sexual sinners, don't worry, forget about it. Don't worry about it. We got it. God is doing a new thing here. Uh, we, we, we've, we've decided these sins are not really all that serious anymore. So just, you know, eat, drink and be merry for tomorrow we may die. And I know Cardinal Supich isn't saying that, but, you know, the, the, what Supich is misreading is that is how people think. That is how people react. It's like, yep. okay, if it's not a sin anymore, then eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we may die. Yep. It doesn't, in other words, it's not a call to repentance. It's not a call to sanctification or holiness. It doesn't call people out of their sins into something higher. It, in a sense, blesses where they are, baptizes where they are, and therefore encourages them to stay where they are. Now, I don't want to sound uncharitable here. So, Larry, feel free to just call me out and, and correct me publicly if you think this is uncharitable. But when I, when I read things like this that Supich has written, I think there are two possibilities, right? And, and I generally try to live by, by this rule of never ascribing to malice what can simply be ascribed to incompetence. And so the two possibilities to me are that either uh, Supich is just simply incompetent, he's a very bad exegete, he doesn't really understand the theology that he's trying to explain, and he's making a very sort of thinly veiled case for what he earnestly holds as his you know, sort of woke progressive uh, convictions. Right? That's possibility number one. It's really just about incompetence. Yeah. Possibility number two is that there is some sort of uh, dark perversion, demonic influence happening here. Um, and that's a, that's a scarier one, right? Because this is, this is a cardinal. This is someone who has the Pope's ear and this is someone who is actively trying to subvert the moral teachings of the church. And that, that's a scary thought. So maybe, I mean, maybe that is uncharitable of me to voice uh, out loud. I, I don't think it's uncharitable. Maybe it is, but if it is, I'm going to be uncharitable now too. Uh, because Aquinas pointed out, for example, that, uh, you know, stupidity isn't a sin, but a cultivated stupidity is. Mm a cultivated incompetence. In other words, there can be sins of the intellect whereby one deliberately clouds one's judgment by not attending. In other words, there is a virtue involved here, an intellectual virtue that a Christian must exercise, especially a prelate of the Catholic Church, especially a theologian, especially a Catholic intellectual. They must exercise their intellect uh, res responsibly, which means they have to develop it. They have to deepen it. They have to read and meditate and think and pray and contemplate in order to develop their intellect. Therefore, when one sees something as completely sophomoric and as obtuse and as incompetent as this latest essay by Supich is, one, I think, is legitimated in wondering if Cardinal Supich has attended to his intellect appropriately and responsibly as befits a cardinal of the Catholic Church. Uh, there's an, insouci an intellectual insouciance here. Insouciance means a kind of treating things that are serious with a certain frivolity, a certain lightness. Um, and I think as a cardinal of the church, he needs to take the development of his intellect a little more seriously. If this is the kind of drivel he's going to put out, he needs to be called out for it. And, and so, in other words, the upshot of this is that one can be incompetent and still be a man of malice because the incompetence can be the result of, of a, of a, of a, of a deeper seated, a deeper seated malice towards things Catholic here. And I think that's, what's operative. I think it's very clear that people like McElroy and Supich uh, and some other prelates as well 
have a certain antipathy towards uh, the Catholicism that we've all received up yes. until five minutes ago. They, they have an antipathy to it. They, they don't like it at all. And therefore, it's not a stretch to say that they have a certain malice against it. Uh, so, for example, what explains Cardinal Supic coming down hard in his diocese on the Latin mass communities, and even among priests who want to celebrate the Novus Ordo in more, in more traditional ways, comes down hard on that. But then he allows all kinds of liturgical shenanigans, as you well know, in, in the diocese of Chicago, Archdiocese of Chicago. And so one begins to see that he has a genuine antipathy towards traditional forms of Catholicism. Yeah. And he, he's got a sort of no enemies to the left of me mentality. All my enemies are to the right of me mentality. And this bespeaks a certain malice in my point of view. It does. An uncharity, a gross uncharity towards fellow Catholics that are his flock. Yeah, I, 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 can, I cannot agree with you more. Um... I think that the next question then we'll, we'll sort of end our, our end our podcast here. We always come back to personal response, the universal call to holiness, how we live out the um, live out the uh, spirit of gospel zeal, especially in light of the Second Vatican Council's call to the lay uh, the lay people to live out the call to holiness. So you know, I, I find myself here. I live in Archbishop Supich's diocese, so I tend to get especially heated when he you know pulls off the latest shenanigan. Um, and we're, we're talking, uh, we're not releasing this on Ash Wednesday, Larry, but you and I are talking today on Ash Wednesday. So this is a, this is an appropriate time for introspection and, uh, fasting and penance, of course, for our own souls. Uh, and we can offer up prayers for others, of course, but as we, as we begin this season of Lent and we do start to turn inward and ask God to renew ourselves and help us become more holy, uh, what are some, what are some words that you might offer to someone like me? who is uh who's often frustrated by the prelates of the church and who wonders you know how much how much longer lord um and you you know i've talked about this before i mean as as a convert yeah. i hoped i was coming into uh i guess you know i knew it was wishful thinking but uh it would have been nice to be coming into uh a church that was just rock solid awesome bishops all around never wavering on the important points of the faith I knew that's not what I was getting myself into, but I, I think some converts don't necessarily know that uh, they might maybe convert more quickly than I did, or just not have as uh, not have as full an understanding from Catholic friends and associates. So you know, you get yeah. you get into the Catholic Church and you're like, "Wow, what is going yeah. on? There are there are uh, there are wolves among the sheep here. How do I how do I respond? What do I do?" I think one of the things that is always helpful to me is to uh, is to find a really good sort of more popular but st but still substantive uh, church history and read it. I'm reading one right now by a guy named Tom Holland called the Dominion, which I would highly recommend to people uh, because what you then get is the long view, and what you get is a deep historical awareness that that the church has had clunker popes before, it's had clunker bishops before, it's had really awful periods in its history before. Uh, I would contend the crisis of today is perhaps the worst crisis the church has ever faced. Never, nevertheless, nevertheless, you get you get a perspective that there is a thread of holiness uh, that runs throughout the history of the church that maintains it, maintains it in its integrity. Lean on the sacraments. Read the doctors of the church. Read the lives of the saints. Read a good church history like Dominion that lays out the glories of Christianity. In other words, let's let's stop focusing quite so much on the negative and focus more on the positive. What Dominion points out is, as, as many others have done, like Christopher Dawson and others in their church histories, is is how glorious the Catholic faith is. How wonderful it has been in history. Let's not focus at Inquisitions and Crusades and all that stuff. Let's focus on the Gothic cathedrals and Dante and Aquinas and the church fathers and, and all of that kind of stuff. And let's get a long view perspective of the fact the church is not perfect. It has sinners in it, even sinful popes and bishops and so forth. And it helps you to contextualize all the lunacy that we, that we, that we see today. To simply say to yourself in prayer, this too shall pass. This is God's church, uh, and he will not allow it to succumb to the forces of Satan. And so we can, we can rest in the promises of Christ to his church. Um, wise words. Uh, how about, how about daily practices of living? I think you pray at least morning and evening prayer, uh, on your, yes, on your farm. Liturgy um, of the hours. 
So that might uh, be a good, good one. Well, I think it's important to, to practice what Brother Lawrence called the practice of the presence of God. And you cannot practice the presence of God unless you're doing sort of uh, certain pious practices. You have to pray. Yeah. Uh, and whatever prayer method most helps, I often, the mo- my most common form of prayer during the course of a day is the Jesus prayer. Mm-hmm. You know, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy upon me, a sinner. Uh, I will often, as I'm taking a walk, pray that prayer. Uh, as I'm sometimes answering emails online, I'm praying that prayer. Uh, it helps to focus the mind in a meditative way. All right. And anything that helps you do that during the course of a day, it puts your focus on God and not on ecclesial disputes. It pulls your, we might, we might say it pulls the gaze of your soul up from the abyss and towards out of the abyss. Um, yeah, I like the I like the image of the abyss a lot. It's why I love the words of um, well Jesus that then John Paul II sort of took as one of his not his Episcopal motto officially, but one of his um, kind of themes of his papacy, which is cast into the deep. Uh, and why I made the tagline of this podcast podcast into the deep because the the deep is the is the abyss. It's the abyss that you talked about. Oh, it is. I mean, I love when John Paul visited America. I mean, when he was a young and dynamic pope, you know, launch into the deep waters, you know, and I was there as a seminarian here awesome. in Philadelphia <laughs> awesome. when he said said that, launch into the deep waters. And I'm like, yeah, I'm ready to launch. I'm ready to launch. Let's do it. Um, so you're yeah. in the deep waters now, Larry. You're right. Oh, yeah. We're bit. in yeah. deep kimchi now. That's for sure. <laughs> we really are. Um, all right. So, yeah, I think uh, I think Lent. I'll, I'll just close on on that thought to to add to what you were saying, Larry. Lent is a great time for us to do this. I think it's a great time to pick up a new practice of prayer. Uh, you have to practice the presence of God. It's something that I, you know, I'm taking my own advice on this, and I am um, having dedicated prayer time in the mornings now when I wake up before I do anything else. You know, before I look at my phone and see what 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 crises yeah, at work my attention, right. or you know, just take some time, uh, take some time and pray. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I encourage people to, to take on other practices as we try to become holy. Uh, it's very easy to, um, you know, point out the speck in our brother's eye and a lot harder to see the log in our own. So uh, I encourage you to use Lent to try to do some of that and pursue Jesus more faithfully. Um, Larry, all right. So I already told people about your podcast, Gaudium at Best 22, where they can find wherever they get your podcasts. Uh, I don't think your blog needs introduction. Listeners know who you are, but uh, Gaudium at Best 22.com is where you can read uh, more of Larry's yes. stuff. You write at Catholic World Report a lot. You wrote for the Pillar actually pretty recently. Did a news analysis piece for them, which was very interesting. Yeah, um, yeah. And so yeah, you can find Larry's and thing. the National Catholic Register. Right. Yep. Written. Uh, I think our last conversation was about one of your pieces in there. Yes, um, it was. And you've got some books coming out. I, I, have you announced your book projects yet, Larry? Are those public? I have a book coming out from Ignatius Press, probably around May, I think, called Confessions of a Catholic Worker, Our Moment of Christian Witness, uh, which is kind of all the basic themes you read on my blog put into a book. Uh, and I'm working on a book for Word on Fire on the universal cult to holiness. It's way behind schedule, but Word on Fire has been more than patient with me. God bless Bishop Barron. <laughs> way behind schedule is a pretty apt label for most of the things that I'm ever working on at any given time. Yes. So I, uh, yes. Understand. All right. Well, thanks so much, Larry, for joining me. It was a pleasure as always. We'll do it again soon. Uh, to my listeners, thank you also for joining. Go ahead and follow Larry's podcast, follow his blog, go read more of his stuff, and engage with him. I've learned a ton, always do from Larry, uh, and uh, always appreciate his time. So to my listeners, thank you so much for joining, and God bless you.